Hey there! Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. As today's Bible, June 19th, 2022, this week by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading the narration of the podcast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, Acts chapter 15, verse 22 to 35. The Jerusalem Convention, part two. Then the apostles and elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men were chosen, were two of the church leaders, Judah, Osco, Barsabas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives, along with your beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judah and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. The messengers went at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judah and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there.
You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. As today's Bible, June 19th, 2022, this week by Pastor Joseph Park. I'll be reading a narration of the broadcast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, Acts chapter 15, verse 22 to 35. The Jerusalem Convention, part 2. Then the apostles and elders, together with the whole church in Jerusalem, chose delegates, and they sent them to Antioch of Syria with Paul and Barnabas to report on this decision. The men were chosen, were two of the church leaders, Judah, also called Barsabas, and Silas. This is the letter they took with them. This letter is from the apostles and elders, your brothers in Jerusalem. It is written to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We understand that some men from here have troubled you and upset you with their teaching, but we did not send them. So we decided, having come to complete agreement, to send you official representatives, along with your beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are sending Judah and Silas to confirm what we have decided concerning your question. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. The messengers went at once to Antioch, where they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judah and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord there.
Hi everyone. Um, in case we haven't met yet, uh, my name's Paul and uh, I work alongside Stephen McArdle in New Life Church uh, in Greenwich. Uh, it's my privilege today to uh, talk to you about the second instalment of Acts 15. As you know, we've been working through the book of Acts um, and last week Roger did a fantastic job of just introducing uh, this chapter. Uh, now we're carrying on. Um, so let's just uh, remind ourselves um, a little bit what happened so far, so we've got the context. Um, so at the start of Acts 15, some, some men come up from Judea, um, so uh, it's sort of around Israel, and they go up to uh, Antioch in Syria, and the church there where Paul and Barnabas are, um, and they say, look, unless, and they tell the Gentile believers, Gentile believers are people who are not Jewish, that's all Gentile means, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. Um, and say to the Gentile believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so Paul and Barnabas are like, wait, hey, wait a minute, what are you, what are you saying here? And they have a, a sharp dispute and the church to try and solve the problem sends Paul and Barnabas to uh, back to down to Jerusalem uh, with some of the other the other men. Uh, other guys and they uh, yeah they call a meeting and the Pharisees who are there they double down they say no nope, these guys they do the Gentiles they've, they've got to not only be circumcised they've got to keep the whole law uh, of Moses um, and so they have they have like an elders meeting and, and Peter says well wait a minute that's not how the Gentiles got saved in the first place um, and it gives that account and his testimony um, and then James says okay Look, it's guys, we've got to we've got to settle this, and it's my judgment, it's my verdict that we should get them to just abstain from from uh, from four things. That's what we're going to ask them to do. We're going to write them a letter, and uh, we'll send it back to Antioch, telling them to stay away from four things. Um, so that's kind of the context. That's uh, that's I've done that really quickly, but hopefully it just gives you a little bit of a, a flavour of last week. And if you haven't so seen last week, again, go back and watch that. It's available online. Um, but now we get to, yeah, the second part of Acts 15. Um, and what, what do I want to talk to you about today? Well, as it happens, um, my, my first sermon point is in this letter, in, the, in this envelope. So let's uh, have a look, see, uh, see what it says. Okay. There we go. Ah. So, what a letter. What a letter! This wasn't just any letter, this is amazing. Um, so a lot of the letters in the New Testament, I mean they're long. I mean Romans, long. Long letter. Amazing, but long. This letter is, is seven verses long. It's seven verses long and it's got so much to teach us. It's got so much to teach us. So I think today the best way for us to, to get at, you know, to get into this is to just do it. We're going to do it verse by verse, people. We're going to do this. All right, so we're going to go starting at verse 23 of our reading today. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, who are from the Gentiles. Greetings. Did you catch that? <laughs> Did you catch that? That's, that's amazing. Like from the brethren. To the brethren, what, what, why, why have I pointed out? The opening statement of this letter is fantastic because it leaves the Gentile believers in Antioch in no doubt about who they are. They are brothers and sisters. They are family. They are part of the body of Christ. That's the way to start a letter to people who are not sure that they're saved when in fact they really are. Hey, don't listen to what anybody else says. You guys are family. Okay, let, this that's uh, verse one. Wow, verse twenty-three. Oh my goodness! Let's keep going. Verse twenty-four. Since we heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls. Doesn't that sound just like the devil, disturbing you, unsettling your soul, robbing you of peace? He will do whatever he can. <laughs> To make your belief in your salvation shaky and your faith in Jesus wobbly. And in this one verse, this, this little part of the letter, um, the Gentile believers in Antioch, 
we're given the freedom, the permission to take all that rubbish, all that nonsense <laughs> of the devil and just throw it out the window. It says, we gave them no instruction. In other words, ignore what they told you. <laughs> ignore what they told you. Verse 25. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men and to send to you our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And you've got to love that phrase, having become of one mind. Like that were unity, that were uni they were united. And you know, I think that when Jesus said, a house divided against itself shall fall. You know, what? I bet the devil was there. I bet he was taking notes going, hmm, yeah, no, Jesus, you're right. That is true. Um, how am I going to destroy your church? How am I going to try and destroy your church? Oh, division, division, division. <laughs> Because the devil also knows that a house united within itself will stand. And I've got to ask today, church, first of all, are we a united church? Do we pursue unity? You know, do we, we fight for unity? It's so important. And then uh, another part of this verse that I absolutely love is the fact that they describe the way they described Barnabas and Paul. They said, our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And if you just think about what Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another, all, all men are going to see that you are mine, that you belong to me. And they'll see Jesus if we love one another. Verse 26. I'm rattling through these, but I hope it's good that you can see this letter is just brilliant. It says men who have risked their lives. So they're sending men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I heard somebody once say that you can spell the word faith. R-I-S-K. Risk. You can spell faith as risk. Uh, and again, what did Jesus say? If anybody tries to save their life, they'll lose it. But if anybody like loses their life, risks it all for me. And for the gospel, what will happen? They won't lose it all. They'll save it. I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I risked nothing for Jesus. And therefore, I, I did nothing for Jesus. Verse 27. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will report the same things by word of mouth. Now, I've got to point this out, guys. This was a stroke of genius by the church because you can just think about it. Like, so Paul and Barnabas, they turn up by themselves with a letter to the church in Antioch, arrive back, and the letter confirms 100% that it agrees with what Paul and Barnabas were arguing for and disagrees 100% with what the other guys were arguing for. When you think there was something a little bit fishy going on, it's like, mm, Paul and Barnabas, are you sure you didn't like pop down the, you know, down the coast? Sit by the pool, you know, oh, Barnabas, how's that forgery going of that letter? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, sign it off by James. Oh, yeah, oh, I love that. That's clever. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think that's really, I think it's been enough time. Yeah, it's been enough time. Okay, we'll go back now. We'll go back. No, Judas and Silas were there to say, look, this comes with the authority of heaven. This comes with the authority of the church where the church started. So you can believe it. You can put your faith in it. Give it the authority it deserves. Yeah, genius. Love this verse. And then we get to verse 28. And we're just going to do the first part of verse 28 to start with. It says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now, the letter does not say it seemed good to us. And the letter does not say it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. It says it seemed good to us. It says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And I've got to, again, I've got to ask these questions. Are we a spirit filled people today? And not just that, are we a spirit led people today? Do we have a relationship with God or are we just religious? Do we make time to pray and listen? I remember once uh, that I felt I was praying and I felt the Holy Spirit said to me, you know what, Paul? One of the, the biggest lies the devil tries to convince you is that you don't have time to stop and consult with me. And so, you know, if, if we're currently doing something and we're not we're not 100 percent sure whether it, it seems good to the Holy Spirit it might seem good to us, but it seems good to the Holy Spirit. Maybe we need to stop and take the time to, to talk to him and to listen. 
So important. Um, okay, we're going to read verse 28 the whole time and, and verse 29 now. The whole thing. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication or sexual immorality. Be another translation. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. So that's the end of the letter. Seven verses. And it's that last, that, that last little bit of the four things that James sort of said in his verdict. Like, these are the four things. Like, what, what's going on here? Like, did, did James and the council in Jerusalem just replace the Ten Commandments with a list of new, new list of only four things? Hey, everyone, it used to be that God didn't like coveting, lying and stealing. But now he's OK with it as long as you just don't eat black pudding. I mean, is that what's going on? No, we've got to think a little bit more deeply about these things. Like, why did they write these things? So the four things to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood, from eating the meat of strangled animals, from sexual immorality. Why? Why these things? Well, there's a lot you could say here, and commentators have said a lot about it. But I think one of the main reasons was that it was about, a lot of people would agree with this, that it's about how the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians could live together in one, in unity, in harmony, in one multi-ethnic family of God. It's about unity. So, okay, let's go through and see how does that fit. Okay, so let's start with number one. Abstain from food offered to idols. OK, so if you Gentile Christians have truly turned away from worshipping idols to worshipping the living God. With Jesus Christ as your saviour and your Lord, then don't carry on eating food offered to those same idols. Firstly, that is like being in shark infested waters and being pulled safely onto a boat for you to then dip your feet back in the water because you like the feel of it. That is a surefire way to get pulled back in and to get eaten. Secondly, um, if you carry on doing this, if you carry on eating these, you know, this food that it, you know has been sacrificed to the idols, everybody else knows has been sacrificed to these idols, then you're really going to offend your Jewish brothers to the point where they're not going to want to have fellowship with you. So again, it's about unity. Okay, number two and number three. Abstain from consuming blood and from the meat of strangled animals. When it came down to it, it was basically about food. The Christians ate together a lot. I like eating together as the church, you know, shared lunches before COVID. I'm looking forward when we can get back to that. You know, we've been thinking about different ways we might be able to do it, say, in the in. In, in a park or something like that, or at least meeting together in smaller groups as home groups. Have you thought about that? Meeting together and having a shared lunch and time together. It's, it's so good. But let's imagine that, like, let's say you and your family were vegetarians. But not only that, you and your family had been vegetarians for generations and you came around my house for dinner and I just served you up a jumbo bucket of KFC. You wouldn't feel very loved, would you? Because the thing was, was that culturally there were Gentile practices that the Jewish Christians would not have been able to stomach. But by avoiding consuming blood and the meat of strangled animals, they would have been better able to cohabit and to eat together. So that's two and three. What about number four? I mean, number four seems a bit of an odd one out, right? Um, abstain from sexual immorality. What's that about? Why, why is that in there? I think that's pretty much similar to number one. It was basically about two things. First, living a sexually immoral life. At the bottom line, it ain't going to do you any good. Now, there are other passages in the New Testament that go into the details of this. We don't have time for that today. But see 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you want, as an, as an example. But... Yeah, at the bottom line, sexual immorality, what does it do? It, it ruins relationships, it destroys families, and it can be immensely damaging to you spiritually and to other people if you insist on practicing it. There is obviously a lot more we could say, but the Bible is clear. When it comes to sexual immorality, flee from it. Now, I said there were two things. Secondly, 
It isn't going to help you to live and worship alongside your fellow church members, particularly those of a Jewish background. We tend to think of sex solely as like a moral issue, when actually um, it's also a cultural one. Um, but in, in, a, in a pagan Gentile culture where sexual promiscuity uh, and was commonplace, was rife um, and even celebrated, you know, go down the temple and have some time with a prostitute. Don't want to get too graphic there. Um, so the newly formed Jewish Gentile church was not going to last long if their understanding of sex and relationships was incompatible. So these are the four things, as you can see, one, two, three and four. There are other things for them to teach us, but basically it was about unity. And how, how was the letter received? How was it received? Well, verse 31, we read, when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. So, we, yeah, what a letter, what a letter full of grace, full of truth, full of unity, full of wisdom full of the Holy Spirit. Wow, what a letter. And by and large, by and large, it solved the issue. It resolved the issue. And, I, and I've got to ask church today, people of God, are we going to learn from this? When, when we bump into a problem, when the devil is doing what he, his absolute best to try and bring division within us as a church, an issue comes up that could divide us. Are we going to speak words and write letters that only seem good to us? Or by the help of the Holy Spirit, are we going to tap into God's solution, God's will, his wisdom, his way of doing things, his way forward? Because if we do that, he will lead us onto and into life, provision, peace, breakthrough, unity. Whatever the issue is, he knows the solution. What a letter. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for helping them write that letter. It's a game changer. Okay, that was point number one. Hmm, I wonder what could be in number two. I'm enjoying opening all this post. Hope you're enjoying it too. There we go. Oh, hey, first time. Check that out. Okay, what's this one say? What a delivery. What a delivery. Right now, I, I want to go back just to, the, if you'll bear with me, go back to the start of Acts 1 to 4, and it'll make sense. I know it's from the passage from last week, but bear with me, okay? Acts 15, 1 to 4. Some men came down from Judea, catch that, and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others should go up to Jerusalem, okay? So they came from Judea to Antioch, and from there they went to Jerusalem, to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. So, yeah, so that's the first part. And you think, well, OK, why are we looking at that? Well, I want to talk to you today about the journey that Paul and Barnabas made. You see, we read Acts uh, 15 verses one to four, and we're tempted to think something like, oh, well, they just popped down the road from the church in Antioch to the church in Jerusalem. When, in fact, the distance between Antioch in Syria and Jerusalem is pretty much about 300 miles. 300 miles. That is like traveling from the prayer house here in southeast London to the Scottish border in Northumberland. Or if it helps your geography, it's like traveling from London to Luxembourg. <laughs> 300 miles with no cars, no planes, and on this occasion, pretty much probably no boats either. 300 miles, but that was only half the story. Now from our passage today, see we got there, Verse 22, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men from among the brethren. And then if we jump to verse 30, so when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch 
And having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. What a delivery! <laughs> what a delivery! 300 miles there, 300 miles back. That, that's amazing. I think that Barnabas and Paul, you want to label them, they were like the original proclaimers. Do you remember the proclaimers? Uh, we would walk 300 miles and we would walk 300 more just to be the men who walk 600 miles with God's truth to your door. Now obviously the proclaimers said 500 but I don't think they actually did it. These guys did it. Now you, I know what you're thinking though. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking hmm Paul but what, what if they had a camel or two or more some donkeys? And we would ride on smelly camels and we would ride on donkeys too. Just to be the man who rode 600 miles on first century transport just for you. The point, the po that might not scan properly. The point still stands. Paul and Barnabas were willing to make a 600 mile round trip in defense of the truth of the gospel. 300 miles there, 300 miles back. What a delivery. And it shows just how far, literally just how far, far, Paul and Barnabas were willing to go to make sure the people in Antioch would not be deceived or duped into believing anything other than the true gospel. And I've got to ask myself, I've got to ask myself, and I hope you're asking yourself this, how far am I prepared to go for the gospel? For the good news about Jesus, to what level am I willing to be inconvenient so that men and women can live in truth, in freedom, in all that Christ paid for, died for, was crucified for? That's a huge question. That's a big question. You might want to go away and really just think about that. But I guess it really, for me, I guess it depends how much do I really believe the gospel? How much do I really believe the gospel? But this got me thinking, what about the other guys? Because it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas who made the trip. The ones who made the journey the opposite way around, who came from Judea to Antioch and then traveled back with Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem so that they could make their case to the council in Jerusalem, their case as to why the, the Gentiles had to be circumcised and why faith in Jesus was not enough by itself and why they also had to obey the law of Moses. Make their case. Did they travel 300 miles to Antioch and then 300 miles back to Jerusalem only to discover that they'd been wrong all that time? Can you imagine that? 600 miles of wrong? 600 miles. Makes me scratch my head. What was going back to Jerusalem like for them? Being at the council, listening to the arguments, hearing the verdict, and realising that the gospel that they had not only believed, but had also been teaching others and living out themselves was not the true one. Believing, preaching, and teaching a gospel that said that what Jesus did on the cross was not enough, that something else had to be added to it. Do you, do you ever feel like that? Have you ever had one of those moments where you realise that a large chunk of your Christian walk hasn't been based solely in what Jesus did for you on the cross, but also in your own efforts. You know, I'm saved by faith in Jesus. Plus, um, plus how well I'm keeping a list of rules. I'm saved in faith by Jesus. Plus, how well I'm doing my quiet time or reading my Bible or how long I prayed this morning <laughs> or any other measure of religious performance you can think of. It's so easy to do. It's such an easy mindset to slip into. I do it. I'm holding my hands up. I do this, guys. I really felt like the Holy Spirit, I was praying, I felt like God said to me, Paul, stop trying to impress me. That I'd slipped into that mindset of trying to impress him. They're like, oh, if I do this, then God, you owe me. It doesn't work like that. And the problem is sometimes I do it for a long time, like 600 miles long. Oh, I hope the next time that I fall into this trap of this way of doing things, that it doesn't take me a 600 mile journey and that big chunk of my life to figure it out. I think, guys, that I'm trying to think of a way to, to give an analogy for this, a picture for this. And I think it's like my laptop. This is my Lenovo laptop. It was a gift to me from my old church. It's brilliant. But... 
in the last few months, it had been getting slower and slower and slower until using it was a joyless, frustrating trudge of, ah! I'm sure there's, you know, anybody who's got a Windows laptop out there, you might resonate with what I'm saying. Of course, if you're a Mac user, you never have a problem. Um, I'm, I'm just being facetious. Um, so yeah, and I, so I bit the bullet. I realized I knew what I had to do with my laptop. I had to uninstall Windows completely and reinstall it. And it was a big job. But bang, wow, it was amazing. Like suddenly the life sapping, joy sucking, wait for it to do something was replaced by speed and efficiency and fun and yay. And I was left scratching my head wondering why, why had I waited so long to sort it out? And so I'm, I, I want to ask you, do you, do you get the point? Do you understand the analogy? Does the gospel that you believe need a factory reset today? Has your baseline operating system of being saved by grace through faith? This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Does that operating system, has it become corrupted? Has it got a virus of your own self-effort? wormed its way in and now it's all slowing everything down and making it a joyless trudge in your Christian walk when it shouldn't be like that. If so, I've got to ask you, how long are you going to wait to sort it out? Don't wait 600 miles. You are saved by grace through faith and this is not of yourselves. It is of the gift of God. Praise you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Acts 15, what a letter, <laughs> what a letter, and what, what a delivery, what a delivery. But most of all, <laughs> underneath it all, what a deliverer. And I want to thank you so much for patiently listening to me today, and I hope this has been helpful. But I just want to spend one more minute, because in case, so, so you know, so have you, you know, our deliverer, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Do you know what Jesus has done for you today? Do you know? Can you see him nailed to that tree, bearing that weight, the weight of my sins and the weight of your sins, fulfilling what no person in history had ever been able to do? Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for all those who believe. That's Romans 10 verse 4. Can you see him crying out on the cross? It is finished. It is accomplished. The work of salvation, the work of taking sinful, shameful, rebellious, blasphemous mankind, you and me, and making us 100% righteous before God in right standing, in right relationship with him. Can you see him? And then by faith, will you believe what the church in Acts 15 believed and believed enough that they sent a letter to confirm it to around the world? It's gone. This message, and if you read what Peter said in verse 11, do you believe this? Because that's what they said. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. With no additions, there's nothing I can do to add to it. 1 Peter 3 verse 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you and you and you and you and whoever you are and you and me to God. We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen.